Janet Reynolds today joins us from the Lacine Library as we were just just talking between the two of us as one of her board members said well we're not really a small library and she, Janet was just telling me that they they encompass a whole city block so maybe oh, Lacine is a little That's bit smaller name. than some um, but uh, we certainly are not small in stature so I was just telling her we might be dropping the uh, name small from this presentations in the future months because it's kind of limiting. All right, well, Janet, um, you kind of know the uh, layout of today's questions. Uh, I will go ahead and make sure that we're starting, but as you feel the need, we only have 30 minutes. We talked about we've got so much to cover in that time. So let's start with the introductions. Uh, who are you and where do you join us from, even though I already kind of gave it away? <laughs> well, good afternoon and I'm from the little town of Lacine, Kansas. We're almost uh, uh, the last, uh, well, we are the last town on the eastern border in Kansas. Um, you can walk a walk five miles and you'll be in Missouri. Um, and this picture is a picture, oh wait, I'm not sharing my screen yet, am I? Uh. Nope, and I just stopped sharing mine. So you should now have the ability to go back to that. Thank you for pointing that out. All right, can you see my um, uh, picture of my library? Absolutely. Okay, Th this is our library. And as I was telling Dan, we may be small in number, but um, we have a large building. And as we talk today, you'll learn a little bit about what we do with our building. Um, let's see if it's going, okay, all right. I'm Janet Reynolds and my life with libraries. I've been involved with them since I was a little kid. Uh, my best memories were coming to the little library in Lacine and checking out books and reading my books and my sister's books and my brother's books, everybody's books because we only came to town once a week. Um, I started out as a library aide in middle school and high school. And in 1979, I started working at the library. I was hired through a program called CETA and they had rules and regulations. So the next year, the library hired me on their own. They didn't wanna to have to deal with all the uh, other stuff. Um, continued my work in libraries, working in the reference and the circulation sections at Axe Library at Pitt State. Um, graduated from Pitt State with an elementary ed degree, came home, helped set up a library at the elementary school. Um, now I taught elementary, um, all the while still working at the public library. Anytime I had a chance, I was at the public library. After school, weekends, vacation, you know. In 2002, I returned to PSU and got my library, library media specialist. Thought I might use it someday. And the next year they moved me to the high school and I became the high school librarian and I did library curriculum testing and technology. In May of 2018, I actually got to come back here and start working full time. And this is where I, where I feel like I belong. This is, this is home. Um, Lacine, most people don't know how to pronounce it. Uh, it's on the Meridazine. We have a population of about 1,050. Our taxing district population is about 2,400, and it includes um, the only gated um, city in the state of Kansas, which is Lynn Valley, and it's the fastest growing area in our county. Um, Lacine means the swan, and I'm a bird watcher too, so I took this picture Sunday of a swan on the Meridazine. So, and Meridazines is the marsh, marsh of the swan. So tell you a little bit about me and the library and Lacine. Um, this next slide, we are a district library, which is different than a lot of people. We're set up as a district and our district is actually a township, Lincoln Township. And we're governed by a board of seven directors who are elected from Lincoln Township. They have to actually live in Lincoln Township to be able to be on our board. We're not a city library. Um, 
We're open 45 hours a week. And this lady in this picture probably is one of my people that I look up to. Jewel Smythe, she was a lady before her time. She, um, she was the one who convinced Kansas City Power and Light that rather than the money going all over the state of Kansas, uh, be better if it stayed local because there was big controversy about the Power and Light um, plant here. And she convinced them that it would make things a whole lot nicer if you know they uh, kept the money here. So we are fortunate we have a good tax base um, because of the uh, generating station here. And in the second picture there, you see a picture of Jewel with Governor Docking. She was personal friends with him and she didn't hesitate to pick up the phone. She saw something she wanted to do, she'd call him. And I was a very shy teenager. And she kept telling me, dream big, Janet, dream big. And if she was here today, she would think we had dreamed big. She went door to door when we went to uh, become a library district, talking to the patrons. And when they counted the votes, there was not a single vote against um, becoming a library district. And so this lady, she passed away when I was in college, but she was a cheerleader for me. Um, and I always like to think maybe um, I got a little bit of my guts and nerves by uh, listening to her talk and knowing the things that she did for our community. This is our current staff. Chris Waddell is the director and she's been here since 2001. I've been here since 79. LaVita does story hour and she started in 2006. And then our library assistant started in May of 2021. Um, Chris and I both work full time. LaVita works almost full time and Angel works three days a week. So this is our staff with the um, um, size of our building. We have an office in the north end of the building and an office in the south end of the building with doors where people can come and go. So we have to run two people most of the time to make sure we have enough staff on duty. Um, from where I sit in the library, I can see all of the old libraries in Lacine. Um, the history of libraries in Lacine um, started out um, with the wealthy. They bought books and they traded them with their friends. And it became one of those things where they, you know, so-and-so bought a book and somebody else bought a book and they traded. And then pretty soon they, one of the ladies had a storefront and they started keeping the books in the storefront and people could come borrow them there. Then there was a, a group called the Zeta Zeta group and they took over uh, managing the library. Uh, it was still in the buildings, uh, still in, uh, just depended on which storefront, but they had it there. And in 1906, they made plans to construct a small um, library. And if you look over here, I don't know, I think you can see my mouse. This little building by the Historical Society is the first library in Lysine. And um, they um, they built that. Oh yeah, my great niece is outside the window waving at me. I'm on a webinar. <laughs> um, so uh, that is our first building in Lacine. And we have it set up now as a genealogy library for the museum. And in the 1960s, it moved to this little building right here it, with the whole brick front. Um, it was only half of that building. And so in 1960, a uh, family gave that building to us for a, a library. And that's the first library I remember coming to. And in 1976, they, uh, Jewel, the lady I showed you the picture, bought the lot next to it and they expanded it um, and made the library bigger. And 
at that point in time, they never thought they would fill the library. Um, it took us a while, uh, about 2006, 2005. There was nowhere to sit down unless you were sitting at a computer. We had a Dr. Seuss program that we had so many kids that the reader was standing on top of the boardroom table reading to the kids because the room was completely full. Um, the community realized it was time to start looking for something else. And so in 2007, we built across the street and we built a building that the architects told us was good for 20 years, that we wouldn't need to do anything else for 20 years. Um, five years, we were, we were full. Uh, we were having programs and everything. So it's, you know, part, it, it was good, but it wasn't practical. If you notice, um, there's all these jets and corners and funny ways that the architects build it. Our architects were trying to win some awards. And so they were going after character of the library. The, the round building, they wanted to put a grain silo there because we were a rural community and um, uh, a grain silo would be a, um, a mark. We told them no, uh, grain silos rust and corrode and we, um, we're able to finally convince them we're okay with the round, but it can't be a grain silo. So anyway, this was um, our building in 2007. And we moved all the books across the street from over here at this building. We're diagonal across the street. Um, we rented carts and loaded those carts and brought them across the street and put them back on the shelves big job a um, couple of things uh, Dan had asked me about is the construction process make sure that if, whoever your architect is whatever you're doing that you have plenty of electrical plenty of storage and make sure they listen to you um, we learned a lot in that first project and by the end of the project, the library board had taken the architects completely off the job. And they put Chris and I in charge of furnitures and fixtures and getting the place finished because we had a building, but we had nothing in it. And the architects hadn't, you know, hadn't moved ahead. So we were, we struggled. Um, we learned a lot. And in 2018, when I retired from the school and started working full time at the library, we started talking about the fact that our meeting room was completely full. Uh, we had more stuff in the meeting room. We couldn't have meetings. Um, everything was full. And we decided we wanted to go ahead and look at ex expansion. And it's a good thing we did. That was the right time to do it. If we had waited till after the pandemic, till the prices of everything went up, um, you know, we probably wouldn't have built. Um, we built with a what's called a lease purchase, the local bank um, and the library district went together. We published uh, that we wanted to do, to do a lease purchase. Um, People in the community were given days to object if they wanted to object. We had no objections. Um, people in the community know we're doing our job. And that's probably one of the biggest things is we were getting the job done. And so didn't have any objections. So in 2020, we had a groundbreaking on Sunday afternoon, the day before they shut everything down. And <laughs> our contractor, we were able to hire the same contractor that we did for the first part of our building. And they said, we can continue to work. We're going to be outside. Um, we've got your supplies. You know, we can, we can go ahead and frame this up. Hopefully this will 
you know, get over with. Well, it was a good thing that um, we didn't have patrons inside at that time. We we were able to finish the building um, by September. And um, in the meantime, when they hooked the two buildings together, uh, we had one of the biggest rains in May and kind of a tornado type thing. And um, so it flooded our existing library. We had already intended to change the carpet. We just hadn't intended to change the carpet quite that fast. And so we had to rip up the carpet. And so it was a case of, it really wasn't safe for our patrons to be in the library, but we were doing curbside. We were, you know, doing everything we could do to keep people coming. So um, we had um, a lot of stuff going on. We were doing story time at the park and we'll talk a little bit more about another story time. But the thing I liked about our second architects, they came down and they spent the day with us. They sat in the library, they watched people, they listened, they asked questions about what do you do in the library? They said, this is not a library like we've ever been to before. And they went back to their office and they sat down and said, okay, you know, this is what we heard. This is what we think you need, you know. And they sit down with Chris and I, and then they sit down with the board. And it was amazing the difference in the first architects and the second. Um, for example, we told them we do a lot of, we do all of our summer lunches in the library. We do senior lunches, we do canning classes, we do cooking classes. Um, they said, well, the kitchen you spec'd out isn't big enough. You know, you need more space. I said, really? I said, yeah. So they designed out a kitchen and they said, you know, if you're doing cooking classes and canning classes and you're, you're trying to cook for 50 people and that, you need more than one stove. So they actually equipped us with a very good kitchen. They also made sure we had plenty of electrical outlets and storage, we got it. <laughs> they took these jets that were on the old building and straightened them out. And a couple of those became storage rooms and, um, you know, utilize some wasted space. So, you know, most people don't live through one um, uh, construction process. We've lived through two, but both of us, we said, there's not gonna be a third one. <laughs> so let's see. Um, Dan asked me about the Star Library. Um, library Journal's done it for 15 years um, and it's based on your I, uh, I, IMLS statistics that you know you turn in and they look at things like your circulation and library visits and attendance and all of that good stuff. And we got it for eight years starting in 2010. And then they added the electronic material circulation and the um, Wi-Fi sessions and all of that. Well, we weren't real good at that at that point in time we got a whole lot better after 2020 um but it's just nice to be recognized for something you do i mean as a small library um you know looking at other libraries in the same budget category and things like that you know we're we are small um so star library is just kind of a, a pat on the back In 2020, we closed. Um, I went home and um, had some family things going on and a sister that has MS was getting ready to move into a retirement thing and my mother was not well. And so I stayed home for a month, didn't come back to work. And I thought I've got to do something. So I started doing virtual story hours, five days a week. I got on Facebook, I read books, 
to the kids. We did crafts. Um, we sang songs, you know, and it was just really, as I go back and look at them, it was really pretty, uh, not so great. <laughs> it was in my kitchen, um, sitting at the dining room table, um, doing whatever I could do with what I had. And came back to work after we got my sister moved and my mother moved and um, put on five days a week during the summer because parents weren't taking their kids anywhere and they wanted something to do with them. And having taught school and having um, been uh, doing this for a long time, you know, people knew me and I had people listening from Arizona and um, different places, Illinois and Indiana, and then a distant cousin in Finland. She had her kids watching it because she wanted them to hear English and learn some English. And she told them, she says, this lady's related to us. So we had a lot of fun with the, you know, the Finland connection. Um, came back, the board thought that I should keep doing it. And they thought it was meeting a need, which it does. It meets a need for daycare providers who don't have a vehicle big enough to bring their kids to an in-person story hour. And if you look at this top picture up here, this is one of my daycare providers that watches my virtual story hours. And they listen to the stories, they sing the songs, and they make the crafts. And um, others live where there's not a library or not a library close, or maybe it's a grandparent watching uh, grandkids. So it's been a, it's filled a need. And every time I say I'm going to stop, um, I get three more people coming in and going, we need the packets for the virtual story time. Um, so it's been a really good thing for us. I'm in the process of transferring my uh, story times off of my Facebook to uh, Nish Academy. So it's behind a um, login. So it's our patrons using it. But right now, you know, I put it out on Facebook Live and then, you know, move it over so they can watch it later. So virtual story times have been a real, um, a real good thing for us. Hey, Janet, uh, we uh -huh. do have a question about the story times, and it was just kind of about marketing. How did you get the word out to people? Maybe it started during the pandemic, but I'm guessing that, as you said, more and more people are coming. So how do they hear about this? We do a monthly newsletter. Um, we still do the old fashioned newsletter. We we send out a letter to everybody in our zip code um, every month. <coughs> and. It lists all of our things. And one of the things that we marketed was, hey, you know, you're not bringing your kids to the library. Um, you know, we can bring the library to home. And the other thing was word of mouth. Word of mouth was my best friend. You know, so-and-so's kids are watching um, story time, you know, on the library with Miss Janet. And um, so your kids ought to be watching it. And so that's where I got the um, the best press was that way. Um, the best, you know, advertising is word of mouth. You know, somebody saying, oh, my kids love doing story time online. Um, so that has um, been where I've gotten the, um, the best press on that. Um, I could spend all day talking about virtual story times or talk about almost any of these things, but. Yep, we only got five minutes, so let's I was going to say, I got to move here. <laughs> one, one of the things that we um, find really essential is partnerships. Um, and we partner with a lot of people in our community, the Historical Society, the schools, and all of these different places, um, because they help us meet our goals. and. These are some of those people in this first one. It's a retired PE teacher that's a member of the Healthy Congregations group. She comes into our summer lunches and uh, does games and activities with the kids. Extension, these two pictures, they come in and do um, activities with our kids. Parents as teachers. This is one of my favorites. Uh, the Historical Society and the library 
work together to do a group called Young Historians. And the kids reenact different Kansas figures. This was for Kansas Day. Um, so, you know, partnerships are essential. Um, groups come down from the school. We have um, instruments that we got with the uh, grant after COVID. My senior group, you know, they love playing games as much as the kids do. And they had a cup stacking contest. Um, a STEM project with the homeschool kids. Um, let's see. I provide, you know, being a small town, community service volunteer things for the kids, National Honor Society, Stuco, things like that. They come in and help with different projects. Up here was uh, the box day for Kansas Reads to Preschool. Um, and the home ec classes or the fa family com consumer science classes came in and worked with our preschoolers. We do a princess day and the National Honor Society girls dress up as princesses and come in and play with our kids. Um, we had, when we built a playroom on, um, when we did that, and this is a, a parents as teachers in the playroom. This one here is my Jerry Fit program. It's an exercise program done with seniors. I have 30 seniors coming in twice a week and it's video driven and they're doing exercises. Homeschool days is something new for us this year. So we're doing homeschool, preschool story hour, Miss Levita does. <coughs> we have STEM programs and the gal from Talking Books came up and talked to my seniors the other day. So um, we do a program with every meal. I have this um, philosophy that we're not um, a feeding station, we're a learning station. And so I want people to learn something. So they come, they exercise, they eat, they have a program and then we play bingo. And so it gets the people out. Uh, the medical staff in our community are really thrilled with our programs as far as uh, what we provide for the seniors. They said it's better than uh, mental health pills for depression, you know, so. Uh, Let's see. I got what a minute. <laughs> you did impeccably well. Um, so we do. If you have questions, you can put them in chat. You can open up your mic and talk. There's uh, our information for Janet because we never do have enough time to talk. So obviously she's got a lot of uh, winning solutions out there. So there's that contact information. Um, I uh, had a couple of questions since we do have a moment. Um, I noticed in that last picture, you can go back if you want or leave, actually maybe leave this up because people might be looking at it. I saw that in your player, you had a lot of wall mounted manipulatives yes. for the children. And I've always been curious about those because it seems like um, they might kind of wane as far as popularity goes. Do you see that, um, that you have to, you know, swap them out over time or it's just the kids are just kind of drawn to them no matter what? We, they've been in there for two and a half years now and we mm -hmm. haven't swapped them out. Um, I got those from a grant from SEK, um, a dream grant thing for um, whenever I applied for that to fix our children's mm -hmm. room. Um, they go through cycles. The kids will play with them and play with them and play with them and then they'll get sidetracked and they'll play with other things in the room, but they always go back to playing with those. Yeah. And one of the reasons I applied for that grant was kids are doing this all the time. And I read some articles where you need to have something that they're standing or sitting and looking straight at and using their hands. And so that was one of the things that I used when I wrote the grant. Um, and it's amazing how well they do with that um moving those things those gears um mm -hmm. let me flip back to that one and see sure if, uh, let's see if i can go back one and and we are up uh, at the end so folks if you have to take off that's great thank we appreciate you being here i know everybody's time is kind of different we will maybe just keep going for another moment as she's showing us this picture but i just wanted to let you know that uh if, if you have to head out we understand and this recording will be available and i'll send it to all of you participants as you can see there there's the gear things um 
there's things that they move up and down um over here this one is matching um and i've got one of them i had a big kid pull it off the wall uh here's the circle thing <laughs> he, he popped the string off so i have to put it back on but um it matches to a circle and then there's a triangle and a square so there's a lot of um neat things there and the lego board my architects um put that up there for me we got the backing and then they put a frame around it and a step, step stool for the kids to well it's neat. so you know they uh they helped immensely that is very popular um so. yeah I bet. um well and so i just wanted also to um as we wrap up I wondered, you know, it's you're sending out this newsletter. I feel like that's got to be a really important part of your marketing. You having everybody vote for the library. It seems like you've really gotten everybody on board. Do you have any other words of advice um, for what we can do to really kind of win over our communities and make sure that they're seeing everything that the library does and this modern version of the library? What well, works? And, and the modern version is something that we had to work on um convincing them that we were more than just a place for books mm -hmm. and what helped us was you know being such a small town there's not a lot here and so we had to convince them that hey we've got something for your littlest kid your next size kid your elementary kids um for the seniors the seniors was the hardest and that kind of fell in my lap because in 2018 they closed the senior meals site and um they had an attendance of one and so they closed it and people were another one of my heroes um had been in charge of that for years and had passed away and um she kept saying janet you need to do something at the library for the seniors and i said well i don't want to take away from the senior site so you have to kind of be looking for things that are going on in your community that you can step up and say, hey, you know, the library can do that. Um, we're um, helping with Christmas on Broadway, you know, kind of we're the focal point of Christmas on Broadway. You know, they were looking for something. Hey, the library can do this for you and this for you. So I told we had some visiting librarians a few weeks ago and uh, they were asking me and I said, stick your nose in everybody's business <laughs> i said and see where you can fit in um you know the exercise program somebody said something to me about um seniors needed a place to exercise and they didn't want to go to the gym because all the high school kids in there um you know i had done a presentation with noah lenstra from uh, north carolina and he called me and he said hey janet um there's this thing called Jerry Fit that's um, they're looking for libraries to pilot and you might want to do it. And I did. And so I keep my ears open as to what's going on in the community right now. There's some talk about a. Uh, uh, oh, my mind just went blank. Uh, to sell fruits and vegetables, um, farmer's market and. Um, they're trying to figure out what they want to do. And I, I called them up. I said, well, what can the library do to help you? You know, and so we got to talking and just as, you know, things come along, the homeschool group kind of fell into that way. You know, I had these people coming in and saying, you know, we're going to homeschool and what can you do for us? And so start working on, you know, as I said, I stuck my nose in and trying to figure yeah, out. I think that's really good advice i think we should probably go ahead and wrap it up i'm going to um just say thank you again janet for joining us it uh we could have gone on for much longer because you have a lot of information that's good for us all to hear so um and i just want to put out a drop to everybody else as i finish recording as i'm always looking for somebody else to interview Janet can say that this wasn't too difficult, but she's also a natural. So, all right, folks, thanks for joining us. And we'll see you around uh, the state and appreciate everything you all do. I'm going to stop recording.